As we grow up, we learn about ourselves through each other and our shared experiences. Part of that is seeing our weaknesses, our fears, the anxieties that go unresolved. So this year, I've been exploring spaces beyond my comfort zone, fronting hurdles that's prevented me from experiencing a lot of great things, persevering through trial and error and training montages, and parsing layers upon layers of menus and mechanics to gain a deeper understanding of things. And after all that, here's my report, my walk to worlds beyond comfort. Being mindful of how we spend our time has turned me away from those massive online multiplayer games. After seeing my friends and family become fully engrossed in games like World of Warcraft and Elder Scrolls Online, that really brought some anxiety on me, feeling all that pressure to return every day and spend enough time for it to be worthwhile. Even so, during the pandemic, after a lot of recommendations and high praise, I decided to delve into the world of Final Fantasy XIV. My preconceptions of an MMO was true at first, with all these generic fetch quests and fantasy tropes, but I did sense something there. So I continued moving forward. No matter where we flew, there was only darkness and loneliness. You are no stranger to carrying the burden of others. But I can only imagine how heavy the weight would be this time. Along the lines of Wandersong and Mir, Final Fantasy XIV is a story that ruminates on the emotional strength required to have hope in face of oppressive despair. How we are a product of our history with others, allowing us to respond in the words of fallen adversaries and companions, and how these moments, how these people have always been part of us. May we please be friends? And it's pleading with us, just forgive yourself enough to take regular breaks now and again and take care of yourself. Because saving yourself is just as important as saving the world. Our lives are overwhelmingly complex, but I believe there's always hope for us to make it through and find new sparks of joy out in the world. You gather pieces of happiness, precious and fragile, only to lose them, then start again. Come now, it's been a gripping tale. Unbreakable bonds and noble sacrifice, sprinkled with moments of levity to counterbalance the pathos. It's got it all. In the past, I've struggled with the trial and error nature of stealth games. Hitman and Splinter Cell, they, they build some excellent tension, but when you're discovered, that game over screen ruins all the tension and thrill of the moment. So Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun shows an understanding of this problem, and it makes it core to actually playing it. You can save and load at any point, and you can experiment in the little sandbox they made, and you can rewind whenever it goes awry. This way, your frustration is alleviated and it lets you see your plan come together one by one. For a fish out of water, the lack of a vision fog, the helpful vision cone, the predictable enemy behavior, it makes it more fun than frustrating to navigate this mix of bottlenecks and open spaces. Just watching all those clockwork patterns through the layer of half-hidden information, you know, solving puzzles by disrupting them just with a little bit of chaos here and there, it's a lot of fun. And you can stitch together all your little experiments into one working solution at last. I believe that is the magic of the modern Hitman games as well. And they consolidated this into a linear experience, and it's been a treat. And also the conversation between your characters is such a joy. It's wonderful. Let me show you how to pass the Yuki Chan. I will not be distracted. Like a sensei. If that is what you want, Yuki Chan. Yes! Yes, I want that! <laughs> Who would have thought I would find an apprentice on the battlefield?
Sunless Skies is a sudden strange version of our world where London was ripped out into space by aliens because they wanted stories to offer to space gods. And because of that, the Queen of England launched a mission to kill the sun, build a mechanical sun to replace it, and then rebuild the British Empire in deep space. The new resource is that you can mine time that's sort of been made physical, and now she's immortal. And then, time is made slower in all the factories and the workplaces for the common folk to maximize the labor effort. And there's dead prisons in this place that drain actual years off of people. Yeah, you might say Sun in Skies is sort of, hey, hey, knocking on our window and holding up a mirror to what's going on in the real world here. This premise serves to build a lot of stories about survival, exploration, and listening to the many interweaving old myths, strange laws of physics, and interactions between ghosts and spirits. It does expect us to live out this role of being in a world that doesn't cater to you, where you have to live this grind of continuous and unending work. Traveling between areas is a risky and deadly endeavor. There's phenomena and rifts in the universe that go unexplained if it's just part of everyday life here. And at the end of the day, you're just relieved to make it through whatever next harrowing dream that comes upon you. The world in Sunless Skies is written to be beyond any measure of description, to deflect answering any questions you might have, and it's like a magic show with very big implications for your own mind to fill in the blanks. Its slow and grindy gameplay does work in tandem with the themes in the story it goes into, but I did find that it kind of counteracted the actual enjoyment of playing the game, so I would recommend just go ahead, double the game speed, so you would enjoy it just a little bit more, and get to the good stuff. I don't like being scared or being confronted with fear, but I do see that it serves an important purpose for telling stories about complex emotions, for physical and emotional trauma, about the fragility of our bodies and psyche, and representing the more grey and immoral sides of our society. In this respect, devotion is an everyday horror experience, where the things that put you at risk is so unremarkable or so ingrained in our daily routines that we won't notice or confront it until it's gone too far. It talks about what happens when you make personal sacrifices for your family, about the constant societal expectations and the building anxiety that comes from that, and how far you're willing to go to keep status quo, when it turns out life has always been out of our control. It's about how faith can be framed as a solution for that lack of control in your lives, and how it sort of ends up controlling your behavior in the end. There is delicate, beautiful dread to how we always return to home, how most things can stay the same, like the kitchen and the bedroom and the living room, just something feels off here and you can't easily explain why or how. Maybe it just has always been here. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is one of my favorite films and manga series in general, starring a young teenager in a world of large mutant insects. So it did feel natural that Mushihima-sama, or Bug Princess, would be my entry point to this shoot-em-up genre. There's this beautiful world taken by nature that doesn't cater to humans, and that motivated me to try time and time again to survive through all these bugs and plants and bees that spray fans and fans of bright bullets that require a lot of quick thinking and reaction time to dodge and to make it through. So Cave is this Japanese developer that is known for developing these small and refined beautiful games that are meant to be replayed over and over again. 
And for games like these, it is very important that the music is progressing in sync with the stage and that the melody changes and the music flows as part changes in each stage. That keeps it fun and it keeps it exciting to play even if it's your 20th try. <laughs> and Mushihima-sama is more character focused and designed with a lower difficulty curve in mind. So if you're curious about the genre in general, I think this is a fine introduction if you're curious. Everybody stays close to the wagons, got it? Stay out of the woods, and beasts take you if you were planning a stroll through those ruins up there. My preconception of isometric sandbox RPGs were that, oh, uh, they were far too long for their own good. They do demand a lot of strategy and thinking ahead, and it does reward you with a, a lot of great world building. Pillars of Eternity, in line with a lot of those games, is drenched in Dungeons and Dragons, Baldur's Gate, that kind of fantasy. The combat and the characters and the magic, it all feels inspired of that solid point. You fight skeletons in this possible battles of actions and cooldowns and waiting and all that nonsense. I didn't find that part too exciting, but the mechanic of reaching out to souls of minor characters, bystanders, even inanimate objects, it colors in the world of Pillars of Eternity in lovely and intricate strokes. People are given elaborate characterization and personal stories unrelated to the main story, and it helps the world feel grander and more lived in. Your character stats give you different conversations options, kind of like the Fallout series, but the option given by 14 lore, that's not always the right choice to make. Being able to do something doesn't equal the most mutually beneficial solution, and it rewards you for considering who you are talking to in the moment. It is also a game bathing in grey morality, and it thrives in having no right choice or solution to the problems plaguing this world. Your companions that follow you through your adventure, they have their own motivations and goals, and you can aid in those, and they will in turn comment and aid in the actions you make. You sort of build a relationship with them over time. And it is a game that gets a little long in the tooth, but it does reward you for existing in the world regardless. The 4x strategy genre is overwhelming, it is systems heavy, and it is in real need of more inviting tutorials that are easier to parse. But if you can break through that cap gate, Europa Universalis 4 can provide a really rewarding alternate history simulation of territory control and warfare and trade and development and influence. There's a lot to get into, it is still really difficult, but I enjoyed my time with it. A more inviting strategy experience that forms sort of this in-between of Civilization and Crusader Kings is Old World, and this encompasses the individual personalities of your country's courtiers and leaders with their own little dramas and affairs and murder plots, and the order system for limiting movement and actions on your turn. It is so well designed, so clever, especially in the later stages of the game because it lets you focus on what you want to do right now and you don't have to do so much of the busy work. I really hope this is something Civilization will learn from in the future, this sort of prioritizing system. Old World says it's okay to not do everything in one turn, and I concur. Well done, Old World. So, how do you define a game like Neo? It is really easy to compare it to the Soul series with its punishing difficulty that really had me bounce off them very quickly. Sure, it is a difficult, level-based game that rewards exploration and caution, disciplined and deliberate combat, and using every tool in your arsenal. You may explore a deadly mansion filled with traps, or a battlefield held by demons, all with winding pathways, shortcuts, and secrets. In Neo, stamina conservation is important, and its timing-based key pulse after you do attacks to regen stamina quicker and clear away curses, it makes combat in Neo very exciting, very active, and I feel like that's an advantage from how From Software's games do it. Their version of Bloodstains not only forecasts possible threats ahead, 
but it allows you to fight fallen players with a little challenge, some reward, and it guides you to different ways of playing the game that the game makes available to you. In these respects, I think Neo feels more inviting than Dark Souls. Though, you will have to go through all the loot clutter and inventory management of it all. Neo's visual variety comes from its heavy inspiration from the supernatural yokai of Japanese folklore and history. I think one of my favorite moments of the game is an encounter with a giant, thousand-year-old, pipe-smoking, spear-wielding Ogama Toad that can throw bombs for some reason. And these bombs discourage you from running away or standing too far from them, and it makes a very engaging and active boss encounter that I just wanted to try again and again, like, yeah, it was so exciting. And I really want to try Neo 2 next year. Having read Metro 2033, I think what the game manages to capture superbly is the amount of life in the smaller settlements of the Metro, as people struggle to preserve their culture, their identity, and the beauty in a world that severely lacks it. They show a deep care for the world and the characters that inhabit it, and lets you be equally afraid of the post-nuclear environments and creatures as the factions of people scouring for the limited resources that are remaining to simply survive to the next day. And that sort of haunting beauty is something that Metro captures to see. Hello there, Artyom. I told you we'd meet again. Cosmic Horror. It's a fascinating road of storytelling because it supports the reader in realizing whatever terrible world warping truths that had been there all along. Something we had assumed fundamentally true about the world had apparently always been a lie. Darkest Dungeon is a recognition that all of us carry our own emotional and physical baggage. That we get more stress from different parts of our lived experience. And that our past reflects our own strengths and weaknesses. You take on the role of this invisible, ever-present entity that pushes people past their fears and limits, ignoring whatever feelings and concerns they might have as they bear crushing survivor's guilt. The game is actually critiquing me as the player, as we've been influenced by this culture that says that stress and guilt, that doesn't really have a real adverse effect on people. We're in a society that wears its workers down to the bone and then just cast them aside like a burnt torch once they can't provide any light in the dark anymore. You see, Horror stories, they visualize, they manifest deeper anxieties within us that we live in this world willing to ruin us for a small profit. Us holding loans, we watch as banks get bailed out time and time again, and the world just keeps telling us that we're contributing to these unfair systems in the end. As the player, we read a person's history and state of mind just as it points on a list, and we quantify them until they're no longer a person with any wants or concerns in their lives. The road to human exploitation is a wide one. It's driven by money and power as sort of the grounding roots of cosmic horror. Their reach and their hold on us being so wide, so long lasting that we won't even notice it until we peek behind the curtain and and end up harmed by our newfound knowledge. And after all these trials, I decided to treat myself to a little bit of comfort zone. And these are my honorable mentions. Lunasis is a short and sweet platformer that feels a lot fun to play. The great Ace Attorney Chronicles can finally convey 2D appeal in their 3D characters. What a joy! Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series, it let me feel nostalgic about games I never played, and it's a weird, great feeling. And Little Gator Game let me be a kid again, and it had an ending that actually brought me to tears at one point, unexpectedly. In the end, I wish to thank everyone for this year, and I hope you'll continue to be kind, to forgive yourself for the next one. <laughs> <laughs>